Well, amidst a Pac-12 media deal that still isn't out, leaving us kind of in the dark on that front, could that impact recruiting? Here we You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view of the day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks. If you haven't already, please like, comment, subscribe wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of Locked On. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We cannot talk recruiting, of course, without our Locked On Recruiting Network insider that being john garcia jr of course many of you know him already if you don't you're in for a treat today john welcome back to the show good to have you as always man good to be back on with you spencer how's how you going and you know life is uh is not bad i got the trailblazer shirt today to give a shout out to my boy damian lillard who dropped 71 the other night the best moment the blazers have had all season probably the best moment they will have all season. I'm more optimistic about the Ducks right now, but not a lot of optimism with the Pac-12 media deal because we still don't have one as we record this episode. We don't know what it'll look like. And I think it's, you know, getting a little bit, it's getting to be a little bit much with people getting over their skis, you know, worrying about this, that, and and the other thing. But how do you see this deal, if at all, really tying into recruiting for Oregon? Like, do you think whatever the deal ends up being, can make a big impact one way or the other? A hundred percent, because that is where athletic directors, coaches, and everybody with the power at all of these programs and conferences individually, that's where they they go. They go towards the money. They go towards the deal. So if something Pac-12 specific isn't reached in, I would say, timely fashion, then yeah, the chances of I don't know, an alliance, a merger, an acquisition, uh, something specific uh, going elsewhere, all all increase uh, basically at that moment. So, yeah, until that happens, I think it's totally up in the air for the Pac-12 because, um, again, that's where the money is. Um, Now, I do think to Oregon's benefit, this is the most attractive program in the future Pac-12, right? I mean, with the USC, UCLA departures to the Big Ten, Oregon is kind of – school a in any discussion that that could be had and i I saw a report today about an alliance with the acc i i saw the big 10 thinking hey let's bring in a couple more pac-12 schools if any of those things push forward oregon will be at the literal forefront of that so i do think the ducks are still in a good spot uh, but it's a good spot relative to uh, the the schools that they're the conference that hasn't made its move in the Pac-12. So I think it's it's a really touchy time uh, for everybody involved here. And, and again, I think the Ducks hold unique value among those those schools still in the Pac-12 footprint. But something's got to shake soon, kind of either way. Um, and, and naturally, this is our starting point, right? If this deal can come together and, and the money is right, um, then the Pac-12 has got to fight and chance, maybe expansion in that direction would be the next step after that point. But if it doesn't happen, it's it's free agency, basically, right? You know, the Ducks will be shopping and, and they will be a coveted uh, commodity because of the brand, because of the multi-sport success uh, and, and the location. The Pacific Northwest has appeared increasingly important to television networks um, and, and the Big Ten in particular. So if that becomes part of the plan, um, you, you tag Oregon and Washington together and, and you kind of go from there. So I'm interested. I, I I was interested at your your initial response here. So Oregon right now can recruit at a very high at a national level. Go up against the USC's, the Ohio State's, Alabama's, Georgia's. Right, same pool of players. We've talked a number of times on this very show about how Oregon is often kind of that big outlier school, right? Amongst the the Southern schools or traditional powers that will be in on some kids like David Hicks, like Mateo, like, you know, I mean, we can go and recap a, a bunch of them, frankly. So the PAC 12 deal is rumored at this point to have, you know, a streaming partner most likely involved. Does that concern you at all for Oregon on the recruiting front going forward? Because to me, I'm not that worried about it, but you know, the recruiting circuit better than I do. 
it's not something that the kids are intrinsically following. I I should say, uh, having seen them, you know, the, the next wave here at, at the camp and combine circuit as that opens up, but how that trickles down from one other schools, maybe looking down at some type of deal relative to the SEC or the Big 12 or the Big 10, whatever it is, uh, or from parents, coaches, the people in their circle that might have kind of adjacently figured out uh, that this deal maybe doesn't weigh the same as, as some of the other Power 5 conferences. So maybe kind of indirectly, yeah, I do think it, kids will will become abreast of that type of situation, but it won't be a one-to-one. Like It's not like the moment it happens, boom, you start to see uh, a lack of interest in Oregon. And, and I think even beyond that, again, the same reason why the Ducks are a commodity for other conferences and networks I do still think they'll hold that value with recruits uh, independent of a deal. Um, sure. When, if, if we talk revenue share and, and maybe the player compensation model starts to change and, and you pull from some of those numbers, maybe it will correlate a little bit more to recruiting. But as it stands today, I think that duck brand uh, can kind of carry on on its own with recruits and they really do view it as its own thing. I, I've, I've seldom heard a recruit bring up Oregon and then start talking about Pac-12 football or then start talking about rivalries or anything like that from a national standpoint. It's usually about Oregon itself. So I do think it will it will still hold that weight with recruits when that offer comes in and, and when visits are are being attempted to to set up and all that stuff. That that's how I've kind of landed on on all this sort of stuff is look, Oregon has had this this rise to prominence at a national level across the country, far more than what it was 20 years ago, right? It's really taken place in the last kind of 10 to 15. But if you go back to the turn of the century, it was a much different story. They had some really good years, but it was not anything like the household name football wise that it is now as the, as the looming potential. And and I think likelihood of being on an Apple or Amazon kind of you know hangs over the Pac-12's head right now. I don't see that really impacting the recruiting front very much. I I, I just don't think that's changing the equation of the calculus very much. I mean, are, are recruits even aware of that sort of stuff or paying attention to those sorts of details? Because the other thing too is the Pac-12 network has had horrible distribution for a long time. Now Oregon might be playing more of its games on on a streaming service going forward than it has for the last you know 15 years or so under the previous media deal but is is that going to shift how recruits view a program like oregon because they'll think oh you know they're playing more games on streaming like does that matter to them at all no no it's it's about that spotlight um and however you access it is how you access it i I think like you said oregon is prominent enough to have marquee games uh, on national television on its own so if it does supplement with streaming, I don't think it'll be the end of the world, especially for the younger generation. It's more, I think we're the issue. It's our generation and above that is the issue with with all of the streaming. And that's where the perception can start to shift and kind of trickle down from there. But by the time it gets to the recruits, yeah, it becomes just kind of a footnote in the process. It's not going to make or break a prospect's decision. Um, again, until it has the conference ramifications in terms of will you stay will you go i think that's really the time that you'll start to see it directly impacting recruiting Uh, all this stuff beforehand is just that it's just conversation it's just chatter it's something that most i would say won't even digest if and when there is some finality on on whatever the pac 12s direction is going to be i want to ask you a question about exposure as it pertains to the media deal in recruiting but you can get all the exposure to the bets you need over on FanDuel see what I did right there I snuck it up on all of you just like that the midway point of the NBA season is here and it's the perfect time to download FanDuel America's number one sports book new customers get a no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars that's bonus bets back bonus bets back nice alliteration if your first bet doesn't win just download the FanDuel Sportsbook app it's safe secure super super easy to use almost like they want it that way and for good reason you can get all the bets you want there you can combine your bets for a bigger payout with the same game parlay don't miss the chance to get your no sweat first bet up to one thousand dollars in bonus bets when you go to FanDuel.com slash locked on that's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more make every moment more with FanDuel an official sports betting partner of the NBA. 
So the question about exposure, John, is kind of the biggest thing I've seen fans worried about with regards to a deal that it appears at this point in time may involve more streaming than the previous deal did, right? So even for a program like Oregon, the way I see it is if you were to, let's say it's ESPN and Amazon, just as a hypothetical, being on Amazon, I think has a greater viewing potential than being on the Pac-12 network. But if you're playing a higher percentage of your games over there, it might be slightly lower compared to playing on ESPN. Does that affect Oregon's ability or any Pac-12 school, frankly, from getting on a kid's radar who who they want to go after on the recruiting front? Because the way I look at it is, look, if Oregon wins its games, it's going to be in the top 25. Kids are paying attention to that. If you're playing in big games at the end of the year, kids are going to watch those. And oh, by the way, a great way to get exposure is to go see the kid in person or have him out for a, a visit. So how do you see that dichotomy kind of playing out? Well, yeah, on the front side of it, it's like, look, Oregon's got a young, aggressive coaching staff, and that translates to recruiting. It means the scholarship offers are coming sooner, and that kind of traditional back and forth between program and prospect is going to cultivate its own interest, independent of whether or not the kid has been exposed to Oregon as much as other programs. And I think it's also important to remember, Spencer, that, again, you know, these kids don't necessarily live and breathe college football the way that that you and I do, uh, to say the least. Um, you know, a lot of there them, are few that do, John, few <laughs> that do a lot of them kind of get into college football as their recruitment requires. So if you start to become a national recruit, let's say your sophomore or junior season, maybe that is the year you start to really pay attention to the sport in terms of a day to day game to game basis. Otherwise, it's very casual. Uh, obviously, look, you're a teenager, you got a lot going on, um, and you start to hear from these schools, and it organically grows your interest in them. And then you start to look back. And I think the other difference is for the kids in particular, Spencer, I mean, they're on social media anyway. I mean, how many kids can you imagine, 16 years old right now, sitting down for three or six hours to watch a couple of college football games? It's just w- without going there as an invited guest of said program, it's really hard to imagine them sitting down uh, in front of the TV and doing that as an underclassman. Now, maybe as a senior, you kind of narrowed your list. You're looking at three or four schools. You're going to watch all of their games. That's a different situation. But on the front end of that, from a visibility standpoint, this doesn't hurt Oregon uh, nearly as much, uh, again, as the adults in the room might might consider because the consumer, the target demographic here is, is the recruit. And on one end, Dan Landing and company are getting those offers out very early. That communication is being established incredibly early. All the visit dates are pushed earlier and earlier in in the recruits' journey now. You can take official visits before you're a senior uh, at the high school level. All of those elements help Oregon and and sort of compensate for maybe a lack of parity from a visibility standpoint on on Saturdays from a television or, or streaming level. And again, social media, YouTube, all that stuff will be complimentary and, and still exist obviously a plenty uh from from all of that i'd venture to say kids are following the oregon ducks football account just as much as they're actually watching the game so naturally they're going to get all the big plays in their feed and they're going to see all of the you know, the momentum and anything that's important enough to track is going to come right to them anyway independent of of a tv screen being around I think you're putting a lot of Oregon fans' uh, concerns to to rest or at least i i hope you are right now uh, certainly but I want to move on here to that that one name in the 2023 cycle. And then, yes, we are going to just briefly discuss 2024 because that's what recruiting is. Like, can you imagine? I have a couple of friends from college who like are kind of getting into sports one way or another because they recognize like, wow, a lot of people at work follow sports or like we have events and it's helpful to understand. So they'll ask me questions about all this sort of stuff. If I tried to explain recruiting to them, in college football, I don't think it would even register in their brains. Like, what do you talk? You, you, you put how much time and then the kid could end up going elsewhere and you put how much money into it. Like, yeah, that, that, that's what this is. So before we get to the craziness of thinking about 2024, which we do uh, certainly need to do at this point in time, because that's what's next on the recruiting front. The immediacy in terms of what's next is Deuce Robinson. And Let's just take out the second series for Oregon baseball uh, in this early season. Let's focus on the first series where they swept the Xavier uh, Musketeers. 
is baseball playing a factor there? And what are you hearing on the Deuce Robinson front? Five-star tight end in the 2023 cycle. I would love for him to be this year's Josh Connerly, a guy that the Ducks grab well after National Signing Day. Yeah, and just like Josh, it looks like this recruitment is going to extend well into the spring. I, I did see Deuce comment on an April timeline. So before we were like wide open, later rather than sooner. Now it looks like it's a little bit more narrow and uh the april timeline is something that uh deuce is starting to to stick by which is good right because that means it's two months before the mlb draft so even if something bubbles up thereafter in theory deuce will have been committed to either oregon or texas or georgia or southern cal i think alabama still technically in there at this point as well so we do start to have a little bit more finality from a timeline standpoint so the next step for oregon in particular is can you grab a visit? Um, it's been quiet on the Robinson front. We haven't heard much uh, about his plans. But again, at last check, the thought was, if I could squeeze in one more visit, although baseball showcases are happening right now, it's very busy. The offseason football circuit is, is off and running as well. But if he could squeeze in a visit, he said he'd like it to be to Oregon. He'd like to check out Oregon one more time. He has been in the past. He's, you know, kid lives in Arizona. He's in that Pac-12 footprint. So it's it's not totally out of left field. But the thought in the recruitment is that you need one last visit because, one, we've seen that Oregon late visit momentum swing for a lot of big-time prospects. I mean, just look at signing day in December and in February. And then secondly – We've kind of viewed this thing as Oregon trailing just a little bit, right? Georgia held the buzz for the majority of the fall. USC held the buzz previously. And there are some reports that say USC might have snatched back some of that momentum. Uh, so that's the intangible. The tangible is Robinson says he wants to commit in the spring, and he is still adamant about not only going to college, but playing both football and baseball while he, he does make that next move. So, again, the MLB draft in June I think could – throw a wrench into any of this because you know money talks and status and all of that it makes a lot of sense but before that point i think robinson's trying to treat this as a traditional college decision and, and again he's adamant about late spring and playing both sports at the next level so he's of course paying attention to, to all the baseball that is now starting up across the country simultaneously well if he's in arizona and uh, you know oregon i'm just throwing this out there as, as a possibility if anyone at the university or on staff are listening if you want someone to go down and make that in-person pitch who's who's not a coach i'm right there for you i'm not that far from saint george direct flight to phoenix i will do whatever is needed here but it sounds like this could be kind of a an interesting dual recruitment for both dan lanning and mark wazikowski uh, oregon's baseball coach who is uh fantastic here so i want to wrap up today talking about 2024 because that's where the, that that's where the Oregon staff is at it's a lot to manage they've already got five verbal commits for the 2024 class first thing I want your thoughts on John can we actually make anything about a verbal commitment at this point in time for for the 2024 class in this age of flips and decommits and uh, but you know pinballing around and whatnot can can we take anything away yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, Oregon is a program. We just talked about it. They're going to offer early. They're going to be in the mix early for recruits across the country. And, and how's this for across the country? You got a receiver from Philadelphia, PA, committed and on board. And he jumped on board back in November, right? Tysir Ty Denmark. Uh, you've got uh, prospects across the country committed right now. Naturally, three pass catchers, uh, a couple in the West Coast Pac-12 footprint. Uh, so it, it's interesting to track. At this point, you know, four offensive players committed. Uh, and, yeah, I think there's some foundational pieces here. Obviously, A.J. Pugliano's a local kid. He's an Oregon native, so you probably feel good yeah, about Medford. retaining that commitment. Absolutely. And, and then, look, the others are in Washington and California. So, naturally, uh, you feel good about retaining those prospects as well. That's in your traditional pipeline uh, from a recruiting standpoint. So, even though they committed in November, December, in some cases, you're happy to have them on board. Uh, here this early so yeah five on board for for Oregon you would imagine the majority stick with the Ducks but you would also imagine that they're hearing from other schools simultaneously so you you take it all with a grain of salt this time of year but the fact that they were on board before the new year I do think speaks volumes because a lot of recruits in in the spring months kind of get hot at one point and capitalize on it with a verbal commitment those appear to be a little more flimsy 
compared to those who jumped on board in the fall and just kind of knew early, hey, this is where I want to go. I'm done with the process. Not as much fanfare because everyone's focused on the class above you. Um, so not the case now for the class of 24 guys who are getting hot and committing now. You could see a little bit more uh, fluidity and movement with some of those decisions compared to those from last year. Not uh, Obviously not uh, an absolute at this point, but you feel better about the longer tenure commitments than, than you previously would. Um, and obviously – all that stuff is changing, right? Uh, the board is changing. Spring practice is going to open up more kids on campus. And then you get your spring and summer official visits. So I think that's the next step for the Ducks in 2024, kind of identifying some early priorities, getting them on campus on an official basis, which of course means it's on the school's dime and, and not their own. Yeah, I, I think their 2024 priorities could go a number of different ways in terms of what they would put at the top of that list. I think quarterback could certainly be in there because there's a lot of uncertainty at, at that position beyond Bo Nix this year. Yeah, you have Ty Thompson, you have Austin Novosad, but is Ty Thompson going to wait around again? And uh, again, having just two scholarship quarterbacks, not something that any program or, or certainly Oregon's program would, uh, would would advocate for. That's just, you want to have at least three, right? I feel like that's kind of the, the consensus is to have a, at least three scholarship quarterbacks on roster. But their, their early 2024 commits, two wideouts, an offensive tackle, a tight end, and then uh, an edge player. I feel like with how heavy they went on the defensive line in the 2023 cycle, not that they won't try and get good players at that position group, but it might be less of a priority. I feel like defensive back, specifically corner because of guys you could lose after this season. I feel like that and linebacker are probably where they they would look on the defensive side of the ball. But is it that simple for coaching staffs that, you know, we prioritize this position group heavily last cycle so we can, you know, take our foot off a little bit or kind of work in, in these other position groups for the next go around? Yeah, there's there's a couple of positions that are kind of standard regardless of cycle, right? You're going to bring in several old linemen, several D linemen, particularly on the interior, pretty much every cycle. Uh, and then a quarterback, as you mentioned, you, you've got to in this day and age of mobility, you know, player mobility, the portal, all of that. You've got to bring in quarterbacks uh, as frequently, really, really as humanly possible, which is about one uh, per year. Uh, and then everything else is kind of a case by case basis. Uh, as you mentioned, in the class of 23, Oregon brought in like 10 defensive linemen. So you don't expect 10 more to jump on board in 24. You naturally will see a bit of a stagger with, with some of the volume at the positions. Doesn't mean there aren't clear priorities like a, like a David Stone from IMG Academy, but you just don't have the volume of priorities uh, on the defensive interior, maybe as you did a year ago. Um, and then the portal is the other thing, right? I mean, this can change a recruiting board quicker than just about anything else out there. Uh, much like, we saw with the return of Bo Nix and it kind of eased all of the urgency and, and the turnover from offensive coordinators and losing out Dante Moore and all those things. It eased a lot of that. You, you no longer have that at your disposal going forward. So even this spring transfer portal window in May, I think becomes quite intriguing from a quarterbacking standpoint. Uh, and then you have decisions to make because if you dip into the May portal pool at, for a QB, maybe it hurts you for a class of 2024 high school quarterback. And we actually, you know, checked this out before the show. Oregon hasn't offered a lot of 2024 high school quarterbacks. And the majority of, of which they have, have kind of started to make their move in recruiting, meaning they've started to narrow their list. And Oregon doesn't appear to be pressing or on, on the verge of pressing for, for any of them at this point. Um, there are a couple on the West Coast that are worth watching. Isaac Wilson, younger brother of Zach Wilson, of course. Uh, he's out in Utah, naturally got a bunch of offers very early in the process. We'll see how his recruitment develops. Oregon was one of those schools that jumped in early on. Uh, and then Luke Moga, a kid out of Scottsdale, uh, who's starting to heat up at this point. Oregon was in early Miami just offered him. He's about to take a bunch of spring visits. So we'll, we'll be interesting to see what those timelines for guys like Wilson and Moga look like as the portal window opens in the month of May. And I use that example to say that the portal can disrupt any recruiting plan. Um, and every coaching staff has to have their head on a swivel relative to the portal. Uh, so basically you're recruiting almost one semester at a time as opposed to one cycle at a time. So I do think you're seeing a lot of schools – kind of slow playing 
some parts of the recruiting process because that portal window is kind of dangling in front of them as, as we turn in, into the month of March, just two months away in May. Um, and you think of the schools that are going to be going through some key positional battles, again, keeping the quarterback theme alive. There could be some really interesting quarterback prospects available when you look at battles that are going to go down um, at Auburn, Georgia, um, Alabama is replacing Bryce Young, Ohio State is replacing C.J. Stroud. A lot of big quarterback battles to be had across the country. So if there's an early indication by any one of those participants that, hey, I might not win this thing, you might see them hit that portal as early as the month of May. Um, And if they've got blue chip status next to their name or some familiarity with somebody in the Oregon organization, now all of a sudden it it really flips your recruiting plan. So I think everyone's taking recruiting in 24 with a grain of salt right now, and the portal is going to throw a nice wrench into it here in a couple of months. And then you reset reset and reestablish everything uh, going into the summer. John Garcia Jr. is our Locked On Recruiting Insider here at the network. Great stuff. Thanks as always, John. Thank you. Appreciate everyone listening. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.